And if you do not do something about it now, uh, it's going to be that much harder, in fact, impossible for your children. Ultimately, I believe here what we are doing is fighting for our children. We are currently living in a cultural environment where, already in California, children as young as five are being indoctrinated into pro-homosex propaganda. This will result, ultimately, in a higher incidence of people who experiment with homosexual behavior, who self-identify as homosexual, who experience homoerotic impulses, and along with that will come all the attendant problems associated therewith. This includes a full array of things having to do with health, disease, mental illness issues, loss of longevity, lifespan, has to do with issues of relational dynamics, difficulties with uh, long-term and monogamous unions. It has to do with gender identity confusion issues and the most extreme and bizarre forms from the tran to transgender and transvestism. And it ultimately has to do with the loss of tolerance in the church. This is not a movement, the movement to promote homosexual behavior, I know I don't have to tell you this, is not a movement about tolerance and diversity. The greatest diversity the ECL, ELCA or any other mainline denomination will experience is being experienced now or actually sometime in the past. It's increasingly experiencing less toleration and less diversity. And you know how the program works. You are the moral equivalent of racists, and you will be treated as such. This kind of rhetoric must be dealt with head on. You are working for the ultimate principle of love in the church. What is love about? Love seeks the ultimate good for the other. What is the ultimate good? In Paul's understanding in Romans 8, the ultimate good is that we might be formed into the image of Jesus, to borrow from Malcolm X, by any means necessary. Paul has this nice word about how all things can work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Actually, that might mean something more along the line that God cooperates with the Spirit in all things for the good. The context is one essentially where we often pray, Lord, just give me the following laundry list of things and my life will be happy and meaningful and well worth living. This could include things like a little more cash, about 10% more income, living in a better neighborhood, having children that continually obey you, yeah, right, um, a better church, a larger church, um, more status in the community, whatever it might be, sex as we would like to have it. And in the end, the spirit within us prays, Lord, what God, what they really mean is, shape them into the image of Jesus by any means necessary. And we say, no, 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 that's not what I mean. But the Spirit is there to give us not necessarily what we want, but what we need. It's no accident that the saying of Jesus, that one of the sayings of Jesus that appears most frequently ap across the independent strata of tradition, from Q to Mark to uh, Thomas to uh, John, is the saying about denying yourself. Any who would come after me must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Anyone here ever enjoy death? Raise your hand. Not a lot of people. Death is not a wonderful experience. The flesh sometimes goes only kicking and screaming. Most people do not like the idea of allowing God to be in complete control over their life when they really stop to think about what they're asking God to do. T. 
to no longer say, as Frank Sinatra once did, I did it my way, but Frank no longer does it his way, <laughs> but to actually do things God's way, this is really quite difficult, and quite difficult for all of us, and we experience it in different aspects of our lives, in different ways, but we all experience it because the flesh does not want to give up rule over our lives. And we, I mean, even, I, I mean, I know I have the best children in the world. I know some of you think you have the best children in the world. Okay, you're deceived, it's all right. But my children are just really wonderful. But even my children, I know from day one, are sin-oriented. How do I know that? From the moment they start off at birth, Wow, doctors, nurses, everybody, come help me meet my needs. And, of course, everyone is all too happy to do that. I certainly am. But it then becomes all about me, see? And a certain amount of that that we then have to work out as life progresses. It's really not all about us. It's all about God. Everything is theocentric and Christocentric. And that includes the area of human sexuality. What I'd like to do in the time remaining is obviously can't make any comprehensive presentation, but I wanted to make some remarks uh, uh, drawing from a, another work that's coming out. James Child, you know, is putting together an edited volume on the subject of homosexuality, and the one person who is doing it, uh, a biblical scholar who is doing the biblical perspective, uh, Mark Allen Powell from Trinity Lutheran Seminary has kindly shared with me his manuscript before it comes out. It has come out, and um, I sort of want to talk about that a little bit because I have a feeling it may be influential in days to come. Uh, Mark is, uh, Dr. Powell is by no means a flaming liberal. He has a high respect for biblical authority. Uh, I think from the little that I know of him, he is a not only a likable and kind person, but a, a uh, man of God in many respects. And that's why it pains me more that an article like this was written. Not that the article is completely off base. In fact, from the other side of things, uh, I think it's probably as balanced as you could possibly get. But in the end, uh, I think he makes a decision which will have very negative consequences and ramifications for the church. Let me read to you some portions uh, that he has written here, two in particular. The church may set limits regarding intimate partnerships. That is, it may prohibit marriage to close relatives and discouraging marriage to unbelievers. But to insist on limits that deny thousands of people the possibility of such relationships altogether is to fly in the face of scripture. The church must recognize the clear declaration of God that it is not good for a person to have to live life alone. And toward the end of his article in the conclusion, personally I recognize the pros and the cons of both arguments and, str and strive to avoid the adoption of either extreme. I'm I'm one of the extremes. Uh, this is to me sort of like asking the question, what is the extreme position on incest with respect to the biblical position? Well, you get the Corinthian position in 1 Corinthians 5, and then you have Paul's position. I guess you have two extremes there. The appropriate stance would be to find that middle between those two extremes. Well, in my opinion, uh, the middle is Paul's position because the middle is the position of Scripture and the Word of God. That is by definition the middle, in the sense that God is always the center of everything. This is not about sociology. It's about theology. 